traditional cohort leaders or in the DOC program, you know, your your um, your leaders, your uh, your instructors or your professors and everything. But we want to give you a multifaceted view of the complexities of what goes, not so much what goes on in our schools, but of the issues that arise in our schools and the various ways that we cannot maybe not totally solve things, but provide an opportunity for you to have some ideas on how to go about working with your school communities to eliminate or minimize uh, what's going on. Um, but before I present Dr. Winkleman, I would like to give a shout out to Dr. Reyes, Dr. G, can you stand up? The wonderful posters that we the fires our previous one, and uh, this one, he has taken the time and the energy to capture those key elements that are needed in our fire. So we really do appreciate you. Debbie Woods, she was here earlier. She set up um, the table. She made sure we had food um, and made sure everything was in order. And uh, Julie Milky, you probably will never uh, see her or run into her, but she works tireless, tirelessly to make sure we have the rooms and the facilities that we need in order to have our programs. And so with that, I always want to give a shout out because she makes it just right. And we were discussing chairs or tables or, or uh, where do we put the food and everything. She makes sure all of that happens. And also, Lisa Gonzalez, um, you're going to be working on some paper, uh, some post-its and uh, the post-it uh, poster board, and I stole them from her, and she just turned her back Well, I borrowed some from her, okay? So I do have to replace that at some point. So now I would like to introduce our department chair, Dr. Pat Winkleman. The only thing more beautiful than that sunset over the Golden Temple faces in this room right now. And uh, just so you know, uh, in this room, we have what we call Tier 1 preliminary administrative candidates. And so, yeah! yeah. <laughs> year, year 1 masters. Uh, we have Year 2 masters of students. We have clear credential students. And we have several doctoral students here. So, um, yay, we had to enjoy ourselves in <laughs> And we have our uh, faculty who work across those programs, sharing a really common commitment to leadership for social justice. So I'm hoping that not only are you going to talk among your cohort, we have this opportunity to hear our speaker who's going to bring us um, further insights and further passion for this work. Um, you also talk among yourselves and so you can feel the community um, of allies in this work. So make sure that in addition to you know being there with your friends and the folks in your cohort, you talk across cohorts. Um, our department, as uh, Dr. Harris said, is committed to leadership for equity and social justice and bold social responsible leadership. Our college and our university share that commitment. So I would like to introduce the Dean of the College of Education and Allied Studies, Dean Nelson. Thank you, Peg. I am so pleased that you are here and I welcome you to Cal State East Bay at this very special event. But I'm also really appreciative, and I want to call out the faculty who really pulled this speaker series together. And I know Margaret has also um, done the same thing, but your faculty are so committed to helping you, and I'm going to use the word operationalize social justice that they took some additional time to write a grant. Um, and so this we can afford to bring these fabulous speakers on campus for you. And that's a real special gift that faculty have given to us. 
It's a win-win. So thank you, faculty. It's also emblematic of the fact that this department and this college really works on ways, thoughtful ways, to live out work. I was talking about um, Katie today and use the word instead of operationalize. How about if you use the word work out social justice in action? And that's what this program is about. Your speaker has a wonderful dimension, uh, a model that I know you said earlier that you brought several, you're starting to bring several streams of research together, and you said it's finally coming together. We just can't wait to hear about that. So I know that. Katie, Dr. Strong is going to do a little more formal introduction. And again, welcome. And I know you have an opportunity to ask questions and to just kind of further your own understanding of what it looks like in action. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Katie Strong, and it's my absolute pleasure uh, to be able to introduce Dr. Robux Hopper. I just want to say, I I just want to say something that if it was not Katie, we would not have Dr. Sacco with us today. And she can explain how they met. And then Katie and I were having a conversation. She sent me the email and the link. So let's give her a big applause. <laughs> Um, CTED and uh, Dr. Declan Rodosako shared her work, and I thought it was so exciting that uh, when I heard about our speaker series, I said, I'm the perfect person. Um, and so I'm, I'm just going to give a little bit of an introduction. Uh, Dr. Declan Rodosako is an assistant professor in the Educational Leadership Department in the Graduate School of Education and Counseling at Lewis and Clark College in Portland, Oregon. There, she directs and facilitates instruction in the preliminary licensure preparation program. And she troubles how diverse voices and perspectives are unearthed and utilized to inform the programmatic and instructional design of the program. Dr. Robux Sacco has been trailblazing in the fields of restorative justice for over 10 years, urban educational leadership for over 13 years, and radical mothering for over 20 years. Dr. Robo Sacco is a boundary scanner who lives on the margins and liminal spaces and stands in gaps as acts of resistance and disruption. By reclaiming her communal labor as cultural capital, she moves between marginalized and privileged spaces, bringing her cultural cash with social capital as a scholar practitioner. Dr. Robo Sacco aligns critical community practice with critical adult educational theory and is informed by Black activist mothering which is a Black feminist standpoint. She understands hashtag Black activist mothering as critical community work that is beyond the biological function of labor. Black activist mothering centers the wisdom of Black mothers as critical community practice. As a Black activist mother herself, Dr. Robo Sacco has birthed six children and enjoyed three home births. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Robo Sacco. <laughs> And so they felt like I needed to tell people I had six kids. <laughs> I don't know if I necessarily agree with that, but um, I tend to err with the young folks because they know a little bit more um, about this. And I want to say today I had the pleasure of sitting with Dr. Harris. So she, I don't know if you all know that she is a comedian. <laughs> did, did you all know that? Oh my God, she had me laughing all day today. Um, and so it was just a pleasure to meet her. And I don't know if you know Dr. Strong is, um, she's very dope. So it's one thing when you're in the classroom and you know, your, your instructor is in front of you, your professor is there, and they're giving you some really good information. But it's totally different to see professors in political spaces act the same way. And so uh, Dr. Strong, still leads up and heads, right? The SIG um, chapter of CPAD, uh, which is very specific around how we engage social justice when we think about redesigning the educational doctrine. 
So you all had some very, very powerful professors. I also had an opportunity to talk with the dean and Deacon and Lynn. So I don't know, like the hierarchy of higher ed is really common. So typically, if you don't get a chance to meet your dean, that's really not unusual. And definitely, even if they're coming, someone is coming in, it's not often that you actually have an opportunity to sit down and speak with the dean, unless, I mean, if I was dunking on training, right? <laughs> then, you know, the dean would be talking to you. But uh, your dean spent time talking to me and really sharing some of the programs that you all have going on here, which again, are very innovative. And on the front line of what we talk about and think about when we talk about educational leadership for social justice. So I'm very honored to be here. And then I met a brother that did the flyers. So back in Portland, everyone was like, oh my God, those flyers are so dope. <laughs> so when I met him, I was like, look, we <laughs> got some good thumbs up with those flyers. So thank you, thank you, thank you. So um, I want to pause a moment and I really want to figure out who's in the room. So I know the programs that are represented here. I heard them from the chair. But um, I want to know where you are. Well, first your name, where you are, and what are you passionate about in education? And when I mean where you are, are you in a public school, a private school, elementary, high school, middle school? Um, are you a counselor? Those types of things. So we'll start, we can start on this side and kind of work our way around. I know, I was looking at, I was trying to give you a good, I was coming. Oh. <laughs> you can stand up with me. I'm, I'm uh, my name is Gabe, I'm the RTI coordinator, intervention coordinator, teacher of Christmas Time University, Thousand Kids Public Middle School. Um, I'm passionate about giving every kid access and opportunities to improve themselves. Thank you. 
everybody the opportunity. My name is Nicholas Archibald. I'm a guidance counselor at a public high school in Brentwood. And I'm passionate about uh, innovating current education, educational systems. They kind of antiquated. Um, and I think through innovating the system, the goal is to provide equitable opportunities through innovation. I'm Monica Navarro. I'm a fourth grade dual language teacher in Bay Point. And I'm passionate about every child feeling seen and heard. Me? My name is Ashley. Um, I am a sixth grade teacher in a public school in Orinda. And I am passionate about inspiring kids to just be the best versions of themselves and kind citizens of their community. I'm Megan Tracy. I teach kindergarten here at the public school in Marina. And I would say, with teaching kindergarten, my passion is building confidence and independence in our society. Yes. Melina Salazar, teacher in special assignment, and the school district public, and uh, intervention. Um, and I'm passionate about life, so I'm kind of contributing in life from the very child and then teaching as a gift to kids. Mm -hmm. I'm Mary Lou Young, and I'm also a teacher in special assignment for intervention and a teacher leader. And my passion is helping those struggling readers and writers. My name is Michelle Thomas, and I'm also a general volunteer at the public at elementary and high school, and I'm um, just so much excited to be here with you tonight. Um, as I was listening to everything, my first instinct was to say what I thought as a teacher, which is to help those struggling learners and help them to get those grants. Um, um, and this has been always been my passion, but um, as I've been in this program, my passion has shifted mm -hmm. to helping teachers want to do those same things for those students. Oh, I know that's not a shift. Mm -hmm. Excellent. And so we'll come to Jonathan here in the front and we'll come back around. So I'm Jonathan Cole. I'm the Cambridge Commons neighborhood um, house here at Cal State East Bay. Um, my title is a community resident engagement specialist as well as governmental relations. Um, my passion is to make certain that our students and our families and marginalized communities get the same opportunities that are allocated that are affluent communities. How many of you all knew that you had a John of that here? <laughs> like just a show of hands. How many of you knew about John of that here? Not faculty. <laughs> <laughs> this is such a powerful, powerful, you all are in like this stuff, like this is the good stuff. If you have community in the same space, as faculty looking at problems of practice together, that's big time. That's big time. Thank you. Okay, anyone we'll move back here? Yes. So it could be even. Okay. Well, I'm Jamila, and I work here as a counselor I'm from LA. I'm <laughs> um, passionate about being, you know, I'm passionate about more deaf students graduating from college. Ooh. Ooh. Are you are you in the doc program? <laughs> oh, they're gonna be fighting for you. <laughs> Hello, uh, I'm Julie Lynn Mario, and I'm currently working as an educational program consultant at the California uh, Department of Education. I'm responsible for all the newborn babies who are sound deaf. I make sure that they get started in education. Now my passion 
which transforms how parents receive information when they're told that their baby is deaf when at birth. Because right now, uh, we have a law that requires a hearing test. And then if they, their baby is found deaf, they're, they're told, I'm sorry, your baby is deaf. I want to change that deficient information to celebration. Your, your baby is deaf, and I'm so excited to introduce you to the deaf community and the language that we speak. So that is my message. <laughs> that gave me chills. <laughs> Goodness. Okay. I'm Laurie Gray. I'm proud to be here. Uh, I just come to support you. Yeah. <laughs> That's my passion. <laughs> Have the tools to access their creativity. Mm -hmm. 
Um, my name is Selena Hill, and I am a lead teacher and also the country teacher at the Community School for Creative Education in Oakland. And um, my passion is um, more Waldorf inspired public charter schools, but to bring forms of education that are not traditionally available mm -hmm. to certain communities to those communities. Um, but also to help create schools that are not just for learning, but are um, centers for social change for parents and other people in the community. Mm -hmm. My name is Bradley Diamond. I'm the assistant school and the Absolutely. And they're on top of you all about culturally relevant practices. Uh, my name is Celine Liu. I work at the County Office here supporting math teachers. Um, I think mathematical learning and quantitative literacy are tools for individual and community transformation. <laughs> and so my passion is really shining a light on that potential and then supporting uh, folks from you know, all parts of the community to enact. Okay, you're a doc student. No. No. Okay. <laughs> okay, so they, you all are pulling on. Okay. okay. <laughs> Hi, everyone. My name is Nina Bakshi, and I have the privilege of working with Celine over here. And I actually work with all of the science programming in the county. And so um, with that comes my passion of really diversifying the science, technology, and engineering field and increasing that school to the STEM career pipeline and diversifying it for our students of color and getting more females and students of color to represent in our um, tech field, which is our Bay Area Tech Hub. Very nice, very nice. Okay, so we'll come to the front table and then do the back table. Hi, I'm Robbie, and I'm an instructional coach for San Francisco Unified School District, and I support um, pre-K and TK teachers. Um, I'm really passionate about celebrating the hundred languages of children and ensuring that there's access and equity so that students really get what they need, not just academically, but social, having social emotional development and autonomy and um, confidence. And also, since it is, we are working with the young kids, it's also creating those opportunities to form partnerships with families. I think it's so crucial and I think it's a place that as the grades go up, it can kind of lose that connection. And it's like really understanding that the families are ultimately the first teachers and you really can't do it without them. So creating systems and spaces for um, families to be a part of the community. Thank you. Uh, my name is Rafael. Uh, Stronger and hold it accountable to everyone. 
My name is Ian Cobbies. I'm uh, a dean of students at a public high school in Newark. And um, my passion <coughs> is helping kids develop positive relationships with um, teachers and adults as well. Okay, last table. I'm Rupert Harris, and uh, I'm program coordinator here at Shock TV Stage. I know this is thinking, I have so many things I'm passionate about within and outside of the field of education. But one of the things that I find when I'm inside the administrator, even when I'm in the classroom, is that the work that the kids get makes in each person who is in the program. And those kids are more like fitness, visually and beyond that, are uh, way of doubting themselves and self doubting and creating a positive self esteem for them. So it's not that everybody has a good way to do it. Thank you. Our assumptions not being right. 
So I'm hoping that tonight we can facilitate a conversation about that. So on the left of my picture there is the Adinkra symbol. It's um, the symbol, the symbology is out of Ghana. Now there are debates around the, the age of it. Some folks say it's the oldest symbolic language. I'm not here to debate that. Um, but what I do know is, is that it's a symbol that is found pretty much all over the planet. And this symbol is the chief Adinkra symbol, and it's believed to have inspired the drawings of all of the other Adinkra symbols. This symbol stands for leadership. So this was the symbol that got me through my doctorate. Um, and then when I was done, I had um, these old black farmers down in Georgia who still farm wood. So they grow trees and cut them down and harvest them and turn them into furniture and stuff. I had them carve out this symbol for each one of my committee members. Um, so I'm very passionate about leadership and what that means. Uh, I am not a traditional educator, meaning I did not, I have never taught in a school. I have never been an administrator in a school, but all of my children have attended public schools. We always, always, always live in the hood until we got to Portland. Because apparently there's no more women in Portland. No one can afford to live in the hood in Portland. Um, but they do still attend public schools. I'm very passionate about public school education. And as we get through the presentation, I think there's some indication as to why I'm passionate about that. Is this the one? The next um, slide is really just talking about what we're going to discuss, and that's restorative story mapping. So restorative story mapping is something that I've worked on. It's really a culmination of my work. And it helps me combine the disciplines of restorative justice and educational, <laughs> educational leadership and critical theory, specifically critical race theory and black feminist thought. Okay, so our time together. We're going to look at some definitions because I want you to understand how I'm defining terms. I don't want to take it for granted that we're all on the same page about certain terms. And then we'll talk about the historicity of harm. And I don't just use that word because it's a fancy word, like it's a reason that I use that word. Uh, we'll talk about story mapping. I hope we have time for playtime. Uh, and then we'll have some Q&A. Okay, so this is what restorative justice is not. Instead of defining what it is, we'll start with what it's not. Restorative justice is never mediation. If you're in a school and you're conducting restorative justice as if, well, they're conducting mediation and calling it restorative justice, run or be disruptive because they're not the same thing, right? It's definitely not forgiveness. That's the F word. Restorative justice is not about bringing someone into a process and making them forgive. It's also not about bringing folks to the process and hoping, well, we can hope, I guess, but bringing folks to the process and expecting reconciliation. And we learned that that was horribly wrong after the Truth and Reconciliation Commission in South Africa. We discovered from the community and the elders and the women specifically that they felt obligated to forgive and to reconcile with the folks that had committed atrocities and harm against them because there was an elder, a leader, Desmond Tutu, who kind of led that charge. So restorative justice is not about reconciliation. So if you have a check sheet, 
in a week, and you expect on Friday there to be reconciliation, again, run or be disrupted. And it's not about closure. So if you expect for folks to come to the table and the folks that have been harmed now feel closure because they sat in front of someone or sat at the table with a person or persons who committed harm, that may or may not happen, right? And it's never about the individual. Restorative justice is a European term for a very old indigenous practice that is found in pretty much every indigenous culture on the globe. So when we think about restorative justice being individualistic, we've also missed the mark. It takes the whole community to participate in restorative justice. So what restorative justice is, is a journey process towards any of those things based on who's involved and what they want. What we think about in restorative justice is we're centering the harm because when harm happens, a violation occurs, a violation to relationships. And in most indigenous practices, when harm has occurred in the community, it's about Harm, the relationships are about harm to the land, harm to the people, harm to the culture. It's not just about the two folks or three folks or the group of folks. Okay, questions? Okay, so story mapping is an interesting process. Story mapping in my mind and the way I define it is about the dialogue that we think about in restorative justice. Because when you, at the basic definition or the basic concept of restorative justice is an invitation to dialogue. That's what it is. Anything else is but. It's an invitation. If it's a forced process, run or be disruptive. It's an invitation to dialogue. What happens in that dialogue, our stories are told. What we want to know about first is who or what has been harmed. Who has caused a violation to relationships? Then we want to know what the obligations are to repair that harm if possible. And then we start figuring out who's going to do what, when, and where. But it's a community. It's not just the person who's harmed or and or the person who has caused the harm. It's the whole community. This picture here is a picture of the Hill District in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. One of the things I did while I was there was organize faculty from different institutions from around the country to come in and do a community walk. So the idea that you're going to come in and we're going to talk about community engagement but we're not actually going to be in the community is problematic. Problematic. So the Hill District is one of the oldest black communities in Pittsburgh. Um, I think several of the hotels that are there, some are being restored, um, were a part of the Chitlin Circuit. Even though people think the Chitlin Circuit was only in the South, it was not. It was wherever black folks who were performing could go and stay, right? So there are a lot of those hotels. August Wilson is from the Hill District in Pennsylvania, from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. So there's a lot of history there. So what we did, we had this map. I worked with the geographer. They got this map, put this map together of the Hill District. And we simply gave it to everyone and asked them to work the map. The key components of this story mapping process was that someone from the community, people from the community, from the Hill District, had to be on each team of learners. They were the guides. And so what they started understanding was, what's happening, if they see a place on the map, I think here, like there's some of the school, child care centers, the circle. When you're walking in these communities with your family and the elders in that community in your school neighborhood, they know stories about those places that you don't know. 
So there was a young man who had some very colorful language in elementary school. And the teacher and the principal were at their wit's end, didn't know what to do. He refused to not use colorful language. But there's a barbershop on one of those streets if it were blown up, and his uncle owns that barbershop. So when you walk the community, you have an opportunity to talk to his uncle about his colorful language. So to make this process sustainable, which is very important to me, I don't think that it should ever be left in the hands of higher ed. It should never be left in the hands of the school bill. It should always be left in the hands of the neighborhood. So this is a PSA. That school building and those classrooms do not belong to you. They belong to the children. So if they belong to the children, that means their families have more rights over those spaces than you do. So that's a perspective, a shift in the way that we think about public education. Right? So I like this word. This is a discipline of history, historians. They use this word when they want to authenticate events. So for an example, if there's a myth that we've read over and over again, the historians will say, there's no historicity to that. We cannot authenticate those events. So when I'm thinking about harm, restorative justice, and when we're in a circle, we can most definitely authenticate the events. The whole purpose here is the pushback in the field of restorative justice to keep it individualistic, and those of us who are pushing to make it historical harms, structural harms, and systemic harms. In my mind, we cannot disjoint the individual harm from those other harms. Who's participating in a restorative justice circle? I don't like circles, but that's a part of the. Who's there? Okay, so when you're in a circle and people are talking and telling their stories, is it? Do you only hear the stories about what happened? What do you mean? With circle people. So if you're in a circle and we're going around, we're telling the story about an event. Is it only about that event, the stories that come out that go around the circle? Almost never. <laughs> you know. Who else? So you, you're still, so you're only still hearing, in those stories, you only hear about what actually happened, but from different perspectives. What else? Who else? Um, so there's a background to it and what led a person to have the first group. Excellent. So backgrounds of the folks. Yeah, like what led me to have that perspective was things that happened to me before. Uh huh. Also, even events that occurred that led to something uh -huh. that caused more serious harm. Excellent. Or like you don't even watch the story. So will we agree with our colleague? Yes, I agree. Okay. So for those of you who are in the doc program, I'm sure you're at the point where you're trying to figure out what your theoretical framework will be. That's why PhDs take five to seven years. Who can figure that out? And how does it make sense? And for me, the big question was, how do I situate myself within that problem? So if you're thinking about a problem or you're working on a problem currently, how do you situate yourself within that problem? Again, back to restorative justice. When we center the harm, everyone who's participating in the circle has a role to play. So that means you're situated within that harm, whether you were a part of the event or not. Communities of circles of support, right? That's one type of circle. So Black activist mothering was something that um, I started thinking about, but then I also found some really good literature on. So apparently Black women have been 
practicing this type of community engagement for a long time. So Townsend Gilt wrote a paper in 1983. And what she did, she interviewed black women who were in New York. They were in their 80s, 70s, and 80s at that time in 83. But they were like spitting fire in the 60s. So what she discovered from interviewing these women, I think it was about 30, 30 or I think she had 30 or 40 women that she worked with us. But what she discovered was a pattern of what she called um, career mobility. So there was this practice that black women utilized to not only help themselves and better their lives and the lives of their family and children, but to do the same for the community. So remember, historicity. So there were events that I could authenticate to support choosing the theory and placing it on the black feminist stance paradigm. Questions? So this is the lens that I look through in everything. Every piece of work that I do, everything that I evaluate, every project that I take, every program that I work with, I'm looking through a black activism other than this. Now, the young people made the logo. They said I need to have a logo. <laughs> and I need to brand it. I don't know what that's all about, but we'll see. I don't have to pay you anything, but we'll see what happens. <laughs> Okay, so this tree, so first of all, let me say that Foucault and his estate are gangsters. When I went to the Library of Congress, because you have to get permission to publish pictures in your dissertation and anything else that you publish, they told me I could not use this picture. Now, how in the world? I was trying to figure out where do they even live? Who still, who still holds and runs that estate? This picture blew my mind. So Foucault's pattern in his book, I think it's the Crime and Punishment book, and it's the book where he's really talking about prisons and uh, surveillance and his perspective on those things. Um, in this picture, he took from um, a medical book on orthopedics. And so what he was showing in this picture was the ways in which crime or punishment um, is corrected, or the attempts at correcting crime and punishment. So what do you see in the picture? Yeah, popcorn. It looks like the tree is trying to grow one way. <laughs> Okay, who else? Ha, ah, it's being trained. Who else? Yay! Yes, I want you to speak. Right, right, right. So something is trying to correct that tree. The rope and the stick. So I see the tree fighting against the restraint there of being placed upon it, but bring it out. Bring it out. And also the roots are starting to come up. So I think I see the roots are being pushed. Yes. Yes. Who else? It looks like it's pushing in your arm. <laughs> yes, the tree is being harmed, right? Say like from the the, the the person that's using the picture, I guess they're trying to illustrate how you can go from one line and you can get the tree to be. Right, so that I mean in orthopedics back then, if we're thinking about back in the day, pediatrician medical school, back in those times they didn't really have all the
equipment, right, that they have now to set a home, to do all the different things. So this was a, a, a what was used to train medical students on how to straighten bones, right, or straighten defects, or if it's something that's broken on the body, right? And so for Cole thought it was um, interesting because the more, his position is the more that we try to correct um, individuals or human beings through punishment, right, we have harm that happens. We have a resistance to being uh, straightened and corrected, right? Fixed, made normal. Yes. It's interesting that there's a tree, and there is, it's a symbol that's used a lot in the deaf community and in my language, <coughs> and especially from a medical perspective, trying to fix something that isn't broken, but to fix somebody else's expectation. <laughs> <laughs> And she did not help me with my slides. <laughs> so the reason why we place, or I place black folks at the forefront of these conversations about education is because you have to remember the history of education in the United States of America. So it started to train folks to be workers, folks to be slaveholders, and it was illegal for the enslaved to be educated. <clears throat> so that's why we really started there, not because black people are so dumb, but because there's a history in education about black folks. So social death, Patterson went and studied, there have been only two societies that have been slave societies on the planet. So he says, I believe him, he's kind of research stuff. So you had one was Rome, the other was the United States. What's a slave society? Yes. Yeah, come on with it, what is it? Right. 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 So before it's even law, right? So the idea, the notion of the state slave society is to build economy and commerce. So you have to have cash crops to have a slave society. That's one of the ways that Patterson understood that we only really had two true slave societies. So what he also understood after doing his research is that there has to be, in order to create one human being and make them no longer a human being, you have to go through a process he named social death. So you have to first make not only the enslaved individual, and remember he's studying Rome as well. So you would have to not only make the enslaved individual believe that they are socially dead, but you have to make the folks who are also um, a part of the process of enslavement believe that that person is no longer a person. So this is Patterson's quote. I want to read it. The slave is not only uprooted from his milieu, he is de-socialized and depersonalized. This process of social negation constitutes the first essentially external phase of enslavement. The next phase involves the introduction of the slave into the community of his master, but it involves the paradox of introducing him as a non-being. Questions? Okay. Oh, what's going on? Uh, so this is, this is essentially like the process of demonization of human beings. Yeah, based on Patterson and his research, right? So he's, this is what he found across studying various societies who had some form of enslavement and what constituted just a society that practiced enslavement versus a society that was a full slave society. Okay, okay so I hear that your professors gave you the readings. So everyone read Lansing Billings and her 
her 2012 address. She's very dope. You should make sure you read that. Okay, so here we're going to tie this in together that I'm not just up here talking about slaves because we can. So who read the article and would like to talk? Yes. Oh, you want what students read the article and want to weigh in on what they discovered that's here on the slide? No? Yes? <coughs> okay, so what Lance and Billings did was she very uh, powerfully, I would add, helped educate the Organization of Education understand the ways in which social sciences have created this type of, or carried out the social death. So who, who remembers eugenics? Okay, who wants to talk about it? Few words, someone who has this book, eugenics. I know eugenics. That's uh, it's a fix as of what's viewed as 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 you said wrong in society or get rid of what in society. For in eugenics, that people want to get rid of deaf people. That is what's going on with our community right now. That's what I'm saying because deaf people don't fit with quote unquote normal. So get rid of them. Fix them. Right, so it's a genetic defect, right? So they have this pseudoscience, which we now know as pseudoscience. However, we still live the learning of that pseudoscience. Yes. Right, and, and really we owe Hitler a lot of praise because had it not been for Hitler, the science, social sciences and biological scholars would not have separated themselves from eugenics. They were on a roll. Who else? Eugenics. So again, you have this call. I'm sorry, go ahead. Uh, thanks to the American Eugenics Movement, that from the study of pseudoscience, uh, we create and measuring things and um, scientific ways to find a certain groups of people and all kinds of madness that continued for a very long time and inspired knowledge. So, Say your name again. Halo. Halo. Like, okay, so we're going to. Halo, and Halo didn't help me with my slides. So we're actually going to touch on what Halo said. So remember what Halo just said. Do you remember? Did everyone hear what she said? Okay. So in psychology, we had the Stanford Binet. Do we have any psychologists in school psychologists here? No? Okay, so this is a test that's still uh, in play. And I just learned that Stanford, you know, Stanford Binet, and now it's like Stanford Lopez. Has anyone heard that? That the test for English language learners. Dude, I thought we said that didn't work. How do we now have more of it? I don't get it. So this is a quote from Lance and Billing. A stratifying practice for providing or denying access to resources. So remember now that it's post Brown, right? Folks are in schools. Folks don't want them in schools because they are genetically defective. They're prone to crime. They lack intelligence. So now we need an intelligence test. And then anthropology. Do we have any anthropologists? No. I really like anthropologists. 
But so anthropology is who we owe and credit to creating the social construct known as race. Does everyone here know that race is a social construct? Okay, because if not, I'm gonna have someone to remove. Okay. So anthropology and realizing this Brady heir spent four million dollars on a campaign to tell the truth that race is a social construct. Did it work? I don't think it worked. <laughs> I'm wondering if they, did that president have to leave the association after he spent that four million dollars? So these are all the ways in which education has been in an unhealthy, dysfunctional relationship with social sciences. Okay, so remember, we're still on the black body, right? Because it's not really a person, it's a black body. And now we're on the favorite topic, discipline disparity. How many districts, school districts in here have some type of discipline disparity, fixer-upper project? Yes, at the federal government stage again. Right? How many people have seen this, this graph? You've been excellent. Who else has seen the graph? That's okay. So here's the story. So when did we find out we had a discipline disparity issue? Who said that? Who? who? Say it again. No, you don't get to. <laughs> when did we find out we had a discipline disparity? And it's not when your superintendent told you you had a discipline disparity. So when? Desegregation. Why? How do you know? Uh, so about the time when Robert Board of Education stepped in, suspicion started to increase dramatically around. Uh, mostly those new black bodies got bust into new places, and all of a sudden those original uses of exclusionary discipline decided to be a little more pointed to some of those uh, darker skinned fellows. Okay, so now remember, we had a decision in 1954 that was a culmination of several cases, right? So it wasn't just some guy named Brown in the Board of Education, right? But when did it get implemented? It took another 10 years. In the what was it, 60? A little bit before 68, 63 ish, 5 ish, right? Because remember, the entire state of Virginia shut down every last one of their public schools after Brown v. Board. Well, Virginia is a commonwealth. Okay, so. 1972 is when we first knew that we had a discipline problem. Oh, we didn't have a problem. Who told us that? I wish I had like, I should have bought some Portland stuff. Like we have Portland rainwater that they bottle and Portland stuff. <laughs> Who told us that? The Children's Defense Fund, Marion Wright Edelman, did a mixed method. Now, for the faculty in the room, she conducted a mixed method, her and her team, qualitative, that means qualitative and quantitative study nationally of what was going on in public schools. She learned that when you're other, if you're deaf, the poor white children. 
she learned that anybody other was being pushed out of school. 1972. Now, who knows about the Office of Civil Rights? Okay, so the Office of Civil Rights did not start collecting data until the 68-69 school year. They used that. And they only used sample sizes back then. Fast forward, who knows Wilson? He's a California dude. You know, he's pretty cool, right? So Lowson, a social scientist, had been looking at discipline disparities. He was the first one to look at children's defense funds data. And he started telling people, hey, we have a problem. No one listened. This is a result of listening. So in 2010, under that administration, <laughs> The, the Department of Education and the, and the Department of Justice came together and formed a task force. They also formed a research to practice collaborative that was housed out of Indiana University. At that point in 2014, they understood that we actually have a great matter at hand. That's a matter of social justice. Children are being pushed out of school and their civil rights are being violated. The state of Mississippi was sued. We hadn't had the federal government sue a state since maybe the 70s. So this is the day that came back. So, and I'm, this, is, this is the black folks, but you can look at anybody. So these are the black folks, right? The yellow here, right here. So they're representing 42% at that time of the out-of-school suspensions, 34% of the expulsions, 33% of single suspensions, 32% of in-school. But what's their enrollment? Sorry. So that's what makes them say that we have a problem. What's this? It's, this is why it's called the disparity. Right? Because they're disproportionate in number to the suspension rate. Does that make sense? Everybody gets that part? Yeah. Okay. Now, here's what we know. How many people know Prudence Carter? I think she's at Stanford. Okay, she's at Stanford. Prudence Carter. Dr. Carter. So Prudence Carter came and started looking at what was going on after, you know, the federal government had come down, they started suing states, state of Michigan got sued. I think two school districts in Mississippi got sued. And they were looking at interventions, RTI, PBIS, right? Because remember, they also had a, a collaborative, a research collaborative, all the top minds in education and social sciences to help figure out how they could put a stop to this, right? So she came back and said, we have an implicit bias problem. And she did that by looking at the, the education, the tie of education to the history <coughs> of racism and racialized practices. Because remember, race is a what? <laughs> right. And then we have social sciences told us that Certain people can't learn the same, they don't grow the same, they don't develop the same, they, are, they don't belong in certain spaces, right? So racialized discipline practices add both issues of race and power. That's what we learned from Prudence in her work. Okay, Gregory and Skiba, I don't know the third author, but these two have been instrumental in, again, social sciences and helping us really understand why do we have a discipline disparity? Why do you only have one group of students who are continuing to be pushed out for the same things, right? Because knowing that a problem delivers or a practice delivers an equitable results is not enough to change the practice. Knowing is not enough. Right? 
improvement, the use for disproportionality of black and brown youth violence. So what Gregory and Skiba, they looked at the results of districts who've been using restorative justice since the 2010, some of them like Oakland has been using restorative justice practices since 2005, before everything kind of hit the fan. Anybody know about the Cole Middle School? No one. Okay. And our joy. Okay, so yeah, so folks were already doing it. And so they started looking at the data, and sure enough, because of some of the practices that have been implemented, the suspension rates are decreasing. But black and brown bodies are still being pushed out at disproportionate rates, even within the improvement. Knowing that a practice delivers an equitable results is not enough to change the practice. Nicholas. Um, so I just want to talk a little bit about the sort of justice because I, I first learned about it in 2013 when I worked at the school in the Bronx. We had to come and talk about the sort of justice. And what they described it as was um, kind of like what you said earlier was that it has to be um, a community. That in order to actually implement the sort of justice, it has to like, you have to shift the whole perspective and, and the systems that you use to run these kind of schools in order for it to work. And what I feel like has happened since then, at least what I see personally, is that we kind of have like this fast food version of the sort of justice where folks are like, we like that idea, we like the results, but we, we can't shift our entire school to, to fit this format, and so we're going to like pull pieces of it that we like and just try to like turn it to something else. Um, it's not really a question, it's just, I guess it's a thought. Yes. And, and, and I guess the question was, can it work in, in, in that way, or in order for it to, to only really work, is to have that transformative approach? Uh, yes, and maybe, mm -hmm. right? Because there's something underlying in there. This is the quote from Gregory and Skiba, ETAL. So evidence suggests that even in the case of empirically based interventions, implementation without explicit attention to addressing disparities is like this individual analog unlikely to reduce discipline disparities. So they really talk really nice. So remember, Prudence Carter joined, she was first author on that first publication that came out that said, hey, race matters. We need to do something about that, right? So they talk about train and hope. So train and trainer is really train and hope. And Gregory TAL, they quoted Stokes and Bear from 1977. Train the trainer does not work. One-offs do not work. Train and hope. Reggie TL said, well, what about implementing hope? That's even worse. So we roll out a restorative justice measure, and we all hope it works, <laughs> right? But it's not working. Now, who's read Cheryl Matthias' work? So Cheryl Matthias is at the University of Colorado, Denver, I believe. And her article that I love the most this is, and that all of my students are required to read, is titled, Check Yourself Before You Wreck Yourself and Our Kids. So what she's talking about is the notion of culturally relevant teaching. She's a teacher preparation professor. The notion of culturally responsive teaching as a, yay, I know culturally responsive teaching, versus, no, I get down with culturally responsive teaching. And so the difference between the exclamation point and the question mark is critical consciousness. To your point, Nicholas, I don't care how many training and hopes, implementing hopes, you can merge restorative justice with PBIS. You can throw RTI in on the front end. 
and then come back around and do a formative assessment on the back end. If we haven't come to critical consciousness about how education is designed, systemically and historically, we can never really work with that individual issue. And I feel like I get to say that because that's what the research says. Some nicer than others, but that's what it says. So in acting critical consciousness, so each of you had your passions. Understand that your passion has to be driven by critical consciousness or remains your passion because you're working against historicity. Authenticated events of systemic and structural social death. And as your colleague shared, it's not just so <laughs> I have students who are in these homogenous school districts, and they say, we, we don't have equity issues. <laughs> so I'm gonna let you talk to them. I'm gonna call you, put you on Zoom, and let you talk to them. Wherever you find yourself marginalized, wherever you find your students marginalized, Dr. Harris gave a profound example because she's been around a minute in schools of a, a homogenous, very wealthy school with a high suicide rate. Why are they committing suicide? That's an equity issue. So if you don't have brown and black bodies in your building, you're not allowed to leave here believing that you don't have any issues with it. Okay, this is Lawson's first graph that he went running with out of his think tank at UCLA. And both the director of the Department of Education and the Department of Justice said, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. This can't be right. And it's been going on for how long? <laughs> so again, not we've had an increase. So this was 2006-7. We black bodies were at 15%. That last graph you saw was the 2010. 2010 through 2012, I think, and we were up 17%. So I started looking at this. I used this graph and I said, well, how can I use this graph to enact critical consciousness? Because again, knowing those numbers are there does not change practice. Here's what I'm talking about. So you have the issue of discipline disparities is in that center circle. Informing discipline disparities are structural, systemic, and historical issues. If you're not moving between those boundaries and dealing with the problems of practice, discipline disparities is just one of them. If you don't understand, as Dr. Harris said, if you want to dismantle something and you don't understand what it is, that's problematic. You have to know. Uh oh. Okay. So, again, I took stuff that I knew and I grew up with to try to figure out how to make some tools. Not tools that I say, aha, this is it. It can work. I don't think none of us, well, I don't know because now it's that other lady, but I was going to say, I don't know if any of us will ever be able to do Ruby Payne and sell a product. She's probably on the yacht right now while we're here. It doesn't work. 
But so come on, y'all, y'all. Now, you all are from Oakland. Do you know Yeye Louisa Tesh? No, you don't know her, baby. So she's an elder in the community. She's a spiritual person in the community. Um, and, and she writes about this in her book, Jambalaya. And she talks about being, growing up in New Orleans, uh, being at the table with all these black women, and it's about 1.2 million conversations going on at the same time. And she calls that gumbo yaya. Now, the historian Dr. Brown talks about that being actually a way that we make sense out of communal knowledge. So again, what does that look like in your space? So if you're working with math, and we know we have disparities in math, you're trying to find out all the different conversations and play about that disparity or that narrative, that dialogue about they just don't like math. They didn't get the skills in elementary school. They're not prepared in middle school. It's your job to trace that narrative and figure out what it's rooted to. Remember the tree and the stick and the rope that binds the tree to the stick. We're still trying to fix people when we paint this book. Let's make them middle class and then they will be high achievers. Yeah? I don't know. So when we think about operationalizing dialogue, and this is, again, Dr. Brown, explains the storytelling practice of Gomba and Yaya as creating a communal dialogue by synthesizing each person's journey. So again, think about the circle and restorative justice. If you are the circle keeper, it is not just your role to come with a really cute talking piece. You are there to synthesize the stories in that circle. And not just from the individuals who are participating in the circle, but what are you hearing that's connected to issues of structural and systemic harm? Bell walking. How many folks have read W.E.B. Du Bois? And he talks about the veil. So again, just going back to black folks, because black folks in this country had to rebirth, resurrect themselves from a social death. So one of the ways that the ancestor Du Bois said, we do that is by veil, that we pass through these veils. Double consciousness. Triparent consciousness. So we have to be different people in different spaces all the time. So when you're in your building, you're the administrator or the teacher leader. Those of you who are TOSAs, so I don't know if you're aware, but this is a national model. You TOSAs in the room, did you know that? Yeah, I don't know who created it, but every school district you go to that's an urban school district has those. Well, in some suburban to I'm learning in Portland. So you have the ability to move between worlds. And you have some authority and privilege to do so. What? You get to monitor and understand, not so much so um, you know, you might not be the one who can step into a, a classroom where you see some hostile learning going on and jump between, that's like our job. But there's a lot that you can learn and come back and reinforce and restructure the programs that you are told us for. So this idea of navigating between systems to learn and transport knowledge, 
and requires the entire body. Because it's not just your responsibility if you are a person that experiences marginalization and you work in a system that is oppressive. It's not just your responsibility to take the knowledge that you gain in these institutions back to your community. It's also your responsibility to figure out how to translate that and carry it back up. You have to work a little harder. So my chair was like, you better show me how that connects to critical theory. But you can do it. And you know what works. You're in the building. You're the experts in the room. You are licensed practitioners. No one is going to allow a doctor. Who's seen that commercial? I don't know if it's Geico, but the, the, the doctor sitting beside the patient and the cell phone has been sewn into the body. Have y'all seen that? And he's saying, you know, we're sorry. And then the, the administrative person is like, we're going to get out. So teachers, doctors aren't allowed to do that. So teachers are not allowed to practice malpractice. We're not the licensed. Well, some of us that teach in these programs, in our these programs, still have licenses. I'm not a licensed practitioner. So I look to you to be experts in the room. And this last idea of holding space. So what does that really mean? What do you think that means? Holding space. Creating a space. Creating a space, yeah. What else? Say <laughs> again. Being, being present in your space, like holding it on, like standing, but being aware and being present in where you physically are. Yes. yes. And then how do you make that communal? So this notion of holding space is where you, in restorative justice, where I expect to see you transform the dialogue. So how do you figure out what systemic and historical issues are at play that have informed the fight between the two groups of girls in the building? Or, the girls that are constantly showing up late, chronic absenteeism and tardiness, but they're having to get little ones to school in the morning because they have to help out. That's not a tardy issue. <laughs> We're criminalizing communal behavior. Where they do that at? Here. So to become the watcher or the witness of thoughts, actions, and behaviors. So when you're in the room, Tulsa, you should be picking up on everything that's going on in that space. Because you have a privileged position that are connected to systems and structures of systematic oppression. So those of you doc students who are looking at intersectionality, you need to be able to talk about the ways in which it causes, or the systematic oppression and how intersectionality is connected to that. All right, how much time do we have? Are we about done? Seven minutes? Okay, so we can't do the activity, but we can pretend to do the activity. Okay, so, so I know you might have to get you some back. <laughs> Okay, so this is what I did with the story map, and remember, this is Lowson's first graph. So in 72, 73, I mapped over that a social issue that was going on. In 1965, the Moynihan Report was released. Who knows who remembers that and knows about it? So this was a report that was released, and it looked at Black folks up north in New York specifically. 
And it said that basically they would be pathologically in poverty because of slavery, that the black mother was demasculating the black man, that the families were dysfunctional Do, do we still hear that narrative? Moynihan wrote that report in 1965. So might that have something to do with that spike we saw in 1972? 1988-89, Charles Murray, who knows that dude? He was the one that told everyone that black folks were prone to criminal behavior and that we were going to be overrun cities by black youth pillaging, burning, and that no one would be safe. Spike, 1989. Also, we have the BC, yes. Are you sure that's a spike? It, it seems to me like if you put it on a graph, it'd be a really like straight linear line. But, right? I, is it really that there was a bump in 88, 89, or it seems like there was a steady increase in disparity? In okay, excellent question. So remember, OCR didn't start collecting data until 1970, and they did not look at all of the school districts. It was only a sample size. So from a sample, of schools. <laughs> they went from 6% to 10%. And but remember with the again, what, what we couldn't even look at the population then because it wasn't all of the school districts like it is now. So all we know is, is that it, it increased. It didn't decrease. So just sorry. So you're saying that there's no like interim data? That we just have the snapshot from 72 and the snapshot. From 1972. Right there is more. No, this is all that's out there. But I mean, you might find some more. And I think that they have, I don't even think they're even looking at the children's defense fund data anymore. And again, remember, OCR didn't have a complete um, sample. I mean, it wasn't even the sample set compared to how many, I forget what they said, like, Pennsylvania, they had 2,000 something ridiculous school districts at one time, right? So they weren't even capturing all school districts. So theoretically, the rate that it's even higher in 72 than it's in 75. Oh, no doubt, for sure. That's what you're saying. Absolutely. We know that it was more than this, right? But this is what we had. But yeah, absolutely. So also, we have the BCAC crisis. That's my lingo. Before crack cocaine, after crack cocaine. 88, 89. Here we have this spike, right? Who remembers the super predator? Okay, so that came out of Murray's stuff. What, what was the super predator? Help me call it. Black kids. Yeah, black kids who were affected by drug addiction. Right, so remember, Moynihan had already gave Congress a report in 1965. Okay, then zero tolerance. Probably the worst thing in our aside from the other stuff. And it wasn't a law. Right? Then we have another spike. And then you have massive social services cutbacks during that time and vanishing public sector jobs. So places like Pittsburgh, the steel mills closed, you know, we had all those issues going on. So my argument is these influencers, again, the hegemonic narrative, might be influencing what we see here in these numbers. So then this is what you can do. So whatever data that you're looking at, you need to investigate the narratives of that data. I'm going to leave you with that. 
You need to understand what was going on there. So when you think about that graph and you think about yourself, where were you in 1972? If you weren't born yet, what were your parents doing in 1972? Where did you live? What was the neighborhood like? Same thing for 1988, 89, 2006, 2007. And that's when we talk about we begin to track and map narratives over space, place, and time, that way we might have a chance at enacting critical consciousness. Because then you have to start telling the story from your perspective. Okay, so I have enjoyed you. I wish we could have had play time. Um, but this is definitely something that you can work on with your students. When you're looking at issues in your building, suicide, gun violence, metal detectors, really help them understand the narratives. But first, you have to understand the narratives. Okay, do we have questions? I think we have just only a few minutes to zero. But any questions, comments, concerns? Yeah, so I'm supposed to. Like, I have the academia EDU. I don't take care of it, but I'm going to start. But I'll definitely, Kate has this PowerPoint slide um, with the notes. Uh, but yeah, anything? Oh, yes. I hope so. Would you invite me to your school? Well, now, maybe, well, I think we'll, I have to bring some people with me because then we might have to end up teaching in the school because everybody might leave. We'll see. Anybody else? Nicholas. Uh, I was just thinking about the article that you mentioned earlier. I don't know if you guys remember a lot of people who were the one that said that a is from high school. I thought that was really powerful. Um, and also, we talked a little bit about the perspective. Of the bed, of um, the fact that the way the education system is structured and how um, the amount of money that's spent per student and community of color versus uh, communities of more affluent or more white. Um, and <coughs> I guess my thought is just that, like, these things are very clear, right? Like, the data show that, that this is happening. And I think I find that. Um, Sometimes challenging as an educator to be um, a part of a, a system to navigate the politics of these systems, as a, especially if you feel like you're a lone wolf, you know, a foreign voice, and trying to uh, navigate this system, which ultimately is your career in, in your own way that you put food on the table. Um, not just trying to be free, so you know, it's all the corners, but, um, but I think what I see happen is that a lot of times you are. Out, cast aside, you, you, you yourself become marginalized. Um, and so, uh, you know, I, I'm excited. I'm, I'm actually going to start to find some positions to be in teaching principals and um, the program that we're doing great. And I'm excited and energized and ready to, to grow. Um, so I guess, um, do you have any advice on, on this? I talked a little bit before we started, but just about how to navigate like that. It's the goal to be like, you gotta stay there to like make it work. So how do you do all that without getting like, ousted in, in the process? Yeah, you have to have a crew, right? So you think about Fannie Lou Hamer and Ella Baker. I, I usually, when I'm ready to just go work at Target, I think about them. And I think about what they went through and what they did, and they always roll with a crew. So you have to figure out who are your allies and how are you guys going to intentionally be disruptive, right? So David Stonewall says, you can't say no. It has to be no with a contingency. So no what or no but, right? So that means you have to do your research on the front end before you go in and stand up and say, I'm not doing that. 
Yeah, definitely. Operationalize your cohort. You guys need to be working like a crew. Like you were getting ready to do a heist. <laughs> right? You got a strong arm education. Yes, my love. My name is Jacqueline Sarko. Yeah, would you, can you make a replica of that? Yeah, can you make a model of that tree with the rope and the stick? Anyone else? Yes. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> I have a question. Um, what type of policy would you suggest that you fight for the state, the Department of Education, uh, here in California? Okay, that's an excellent question. So Sonia Douglas Horseford, another author, I would suggest you all read her stuff. And so Sonia's work has always been around desegregation. She's like a we like she's like the person over desegregation of immigration. But what she's learning is that there there has to be a way of doing exactly in my mind what you're doing, like what she talks about in theory and in practice that she's doing. You all, in this group that you have here on campus, you all are already doing that. So, and again, it goes back to Satima Clark. Remember, without Satima Clark, we wouldn't have had a civil rights movement because Dr. King and them ain't know nothing about educating folks on his own right. She had to teach them about adult education. So it's that model that you have of bringing folks in, teaching folks, you all make it sustainable, you know, not trained in hope, but actually giving that information over, handing it over to people. Yeah, but you have, it's contextual. You have to know California and, what, and what's needed in your community. And her name is Sonia Douglas. Horse Ford. Okay. Just a comment. You make me think about the, um, the ongoing urgency of the work. And I'm a little emotional because the, uh, the crack epidemic destroyed my family mm -hmm. and so um but that urgency has always been i mean it's always been there it's not just now the urgency is ongoing and so when it's important to you and you internalize it and you carry it there's also that um internal stress that comes with it but i guess i'm thinking about the brothers uh comment and just the tenacity that's needed mm -hmm. if you really want to work and with everything going on in the United States right now, the nonsense coming out of the White House, the shootings, the killings, people are still uncomfortable when it comes to talking about race. And you talk about, you want to talk about black people, the room gets quiet. Because then it's well all people. And it's really <laughs> a challenge, even here in the Bay Area, it's still hard. Even in our school districts, which are full of so many children of color, it's still yeah, I think that we have to, well, not I think, it, we pretty much have to change the narrative. So even though we talked about enslavement tonight, we talked about it through a different lens. So it has to be that moment when we're talking about these issues in a way, we're talking about them from a position of empowerment. Right, so not from a position of, you know, even when we talk about the crack cocaine epidemic, I get into it with my sociology colleague, he gave me some really cool comments about this. You can't come and talk about issues that are going on and what communities are doing or not doing until we talk about the historical and the structural and the systemic pieces, especially with crack cocaine, okay, right? So we have to change our narrative. It's time. And we have to look at our history. So look at the Black Female Literary Society. Are you familiar with those? So they ran a whole lot of stuff that people didn't know about who they were and what they did. But they had also had a method of getting things done. Had it not been for them, we would have lost the baseball league and the black newspapers. Who else? I have a comment. Um, I would love to grab the opportunity because I have interpreters here and I have access to you all. Uh, I know that there's a, a pediatrician here. Um, 
And, and I'm very interesting to me. I'm curious. Uh, do you, you are the chief musician. What do you hear about that? Um, you know, I, I probably don't hear
Just um, get out of here, and I need to um, actually. I gotta turn this off real quick. All righty, and I will end meeting for all.